session 12, sites. Uh, site session 12 for this uh, yeah. IOC Westpac uh, kickoff conference for yeah. UN decade. So, um, I will start first, uh, Kazumi. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So, um, um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone, um, for the windows. Elsa, your um, please uh, make sure that your your mic is muted for the moment. Um, then when you want to speak, then you can turn on and raise your hand, use the raise hand function. And uh, then I think the, the secretary actually asked us to, to have a group photo. So I would like to ask everyone to turn on the, your video now. So then we can start with the group photo. And uh, I, I guess this is a very important business for record purpose. So we, yes. we probably try to do this first and get everyone to have uh, the admin will help us to uh, record uh, the uh, the whole meeting will be recorded and eventually the the recording will be shared uh, online. So uh, please uh, take note of that. I think the recording already started. And I guess now we can have our um, group photo. So uh, please admin. So because there's involved more than one, uh, there are more people. So it, it will probably take some time. So admin, please let us know. And uh, so when it's ready. Okay, so I guess. Miss, Miss Tan, I always, okay, now it's better. All right, so everybody ready? And some people, they don't have camera on uh, on their computer, which is fine. So I have one, two, three, just a moment. One more shot. Okay. Someone just come. Okay. If that is ready, then we, we can. Okay. So, um, give me a minute. Somebody trying okay, okay. to turn on the camera. Okay, okay. Yes. Miss Riani, I only see half of you. So you could move back a little bit. Okay. Uh, please keep your mic muted if you are not so to to in to ensure that we are able to go through the presentation and discussion later on. Yeah. Thank okay, you. All right, that's be all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, I mean So I think we have to start with the, the agenda today. So I first of all I would like to Thanks everyone for coming and join our sessions. And this is an event that organized uh, with, um, initiated by IOC Westpac Hub program. So, and uh, there are two conveners for this uh, sessions, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kazumi Wakita from Tokai University and me, myself uh, from Otin Lim from University of Malaya. So I will go give some brief intros on, on the rationals and the objective. Uh, we are very happy to see Fukuya Sensei here with us. So I guess that will be, uh, we will certainly will get very uh, useful feedback and input from, from him. So as the founder of this program. So let me share my screen and a few slides that I have uh, for today. Um, so, okay, I hope you can see. Are you seeing my slide now? I also got confused. Okay, so are you <laughs> seeing fun. the slide now? So, so the theme, the title of the, the session is actually Fostering Transform Transformative Hub Sciences for Socio Societal Applications. I think we are aware of the UN Decade Oceans and UN Decade for 2030. And because of that, and, and because of the importance of harmful algal bloom and how we need to do, what we need to do to align with 
some of the ocean you indicate ocean outcome so and that is the purpose for the meeting today and also the discussion today and we have identified several speakers that are trying to you know give us some idea and uh, some uh, advancement that we have in hub sciences that might be useful to aid our discussion for today. So I, I guess uh, for those not familiar with the seven ocean decadal outcome, safe oceans, predict, productive oceans, predictive oceans, uh, those uh, ocean outcome that we want to achieve that very much related to, to uh, harmful algal bloom, the importance of uh, you know, food safety, food security, and, and so on. So with that in background, so, and I guess we are all aware of the West Spec Hub program that have been um, there for so long, um, founded by uh, Professor Fukuyo. So, and it's time for us to look at uh, what we have achieved so far and also what, what we need to do to move forward. And from, and we have several speakers. I would try to uh, go through the introductions and. We will start with um, a, the talk by uh, Dr. Iwataki, Mitsuru Iwataki from University of Tokyo to look at uh, the half species that we have, uh, uh, both biology and ecology, the identifications of half in this region, what are the emerging species that we should look at. And uh, I guess he will, he will give us some uh, idea on to, for, for further discussion. So um, I think this slide. So um, I, uh, Dr. Shi Kensun from UM will talk about meta barcoding and DNA analysis. And, uh, and also Kazumi, because Bakita from, uh, Dr. Bakita from Tokai University will talk about the socioeconomic impact uh, of hub in this region. Then followed by uh, Aleta to look at modeling so which is quite modeling and early warning, which is very, very important. And, and then we will have two presentations uh, from Korea and China to look at um, the hub monitoring program. And at the end of this sessions, we have uh, a discussion. So I try to keep some time for discussion. I guess that is very, very important for, for this particular meeting, what we need to do to come up with some some plans, some activities that can contribute to UN Decade. So that's why it's a Decade Actions Incubators. We should, we hope that we can, we can come up with something to, to, to reach that. So, um, and I, in the process of applying for this, um, the, the kickoff sessions, we also apply to get a Global Hub endorsement. So we will see here, what is Global Hub? If you like to know more, this is a, a, a international program um, that's supported by IOC and SCORE at the same time. And uh, there are, uh, it's a continuation of program from Global Hub, uh, Joe Hub to Global Hub now. And we also have a documentation related to Joe Hub Asia that will be very, very valuable document uh, during Fukuyo's time and Professor Furuya's time. So those, those are the document, documentations that we should refer to, to look at. Uh, how, what we want to proceed and how we want to proceed from there. So I guess the issues of hub is very complicated in these regions and we have to look at various type of issues, not only the land derived input, um, but also how the changes, not only the surface, but also the bottom, not only the fish, but also shellfish. And we are seeing more shellfish and other marine invertebrate that have been impacted, like what happens in Hokkaido recently the carinia bloom that related to the massive mortality and fishery of uh, sea urchin. So, and um, I already mentioned about the five speaker that we, we're going, six speaker that we have here. So I guess uh, we will go through, we'll start with a, a talk by Dr. Iwataki. And uh, the time given is 12 minutes, even though we stated uh, 15 minutes here, I hope that we have uh, three minutes roughly about two, three minutes each, if possible. Uh, but at the end of the sessions, we have about 25 minutes because I, when I follow the, uh, the sessions yesterday, we, we noticed that there are many sessions that uh, there, there's no time remain for, for any further discussions among the, 
the speaker and also the, the participant. So I guess that is something we would like to achieve. So I think while uh, looking at that, uh, try to think about the what, the where, the how, and the when, why, and who about hubs. So I guess these are some of the questions mark that we might have related to, uh, maybe that you can post to your the, the speaker later on about this and what then consider this in your uh, in our discussions at the end of the presentations okay so without uh, further ado so i would like to invite uh, dr ivataki so so the time is yours thank you thank you boting can i start sure sure yeah, yeah. So the, I think my face is not necessary. I'm Mitsunori Iwataki from the University of Tokyo, working on the taxonomy and the phylogeny of microalgae, especially the marine harmful dinoflagellates. In this, my presentation, I will introduce the causative species of harvest. Oh yeah, how to go ahead. This one, oh, yeah, okay. Harmful algal blooms have a uh, natural phenomena of proliferation of the microalgal or macroalgal species causing problems on fisheries and human health. Fisheries damage of hubs are caused by harmful algal species, which kills marine organisms such as fish or shellfish, and human health problems of hubs are caused by toxins, which is accumulated in shellfishes or fish that consumed by human. These harmful and the toxic effects are caused by microalgae, and we are studying to identify such causative species of hives. So the two understand the proliferation of microalgae and to mitigate the, its negative effects, monitoring of hives are carried out. Basic skills of hub monitoring is microscopic observation to detect harmful bloom species and to count the cell number to understand the increase and decrease of cell densities of hub species. For example, in this right microscopic field, or we usually observe like this, the many long and brownish cells are thicket dinoflagellate ceratium. Some other transparent or slightly reddish protoperitoneum like this, brownish diatoms, like this, and small numbers of DST, dialectic shellfish toxin producer, dinophysis species indicated in red circles, like this. So the identification of the harvest uh, basically depending on the skills and knowledge of harvest species. For microscopic identification of the harvest species, harmful red tide and the shellfish poisoning in causative microalgae are understood. Actually, these slides are prepared by Dr. Fuya. For example, harmful red tide species of the dinoflagellate cocodrodine polyglycoides and Karenia mikimotai and the PSP, DSP, ASP causative species such as the dinoflagellate alexandrium dinophysis and the diatom shudonichi. In the global scale, available information of the hub species have been compiled at the IOC UNESCO taxonomic reference list of microalgae. And all we can access to the information of all hub species in this webpage, please visit. This hub species information is managed by taxonomy task team members of intergovernmental panel of harmful agar brooms. We had a workshop last, last week and we report the updated information of the relevant taxonomic group, such as new paper references, distribution, and the DNA sequences of each hub species until the next workshop in the next March. In this IOC UNESCO taxonomic reference list of microalgae, information of hub species have been updated. Currently, almost 200 species in total which consists of 45 cyanobacteria, 31 diatoms, eight haptophytes, 
dinoflagellates are separated into lower taxa, such as for Amphidinearis, 12 Dinophysiaris, 47 Gonyolacaris, 19 Gymnodinearis, 2 Peridinearis, 13 Procentralis, 3 Toracospiralis, 4 Amphidomatasi, and 6 Lactophytes, 3 Dictyocophytes, and 2 Pelagophytes. Of these, 80 Seven species have been listed after the year 2000, including new species and new combinations, and 43 species after 2010. Like this, how species in the world list is still increasing. In the Western Pacific, this region, we also know that how species are gathered in this region. Shellfish poisoning toxin producing species like the Paradinium bahamense, Alexandrium species, Pseudonychia species, and harmful red tied species such as Cochlodinium polyculicoides, Karenia mikimotoi, and Chattonella species are common in this region. Now I talk about harmful species, harmful bloom species and its local list. This is an example from Nagasaki Prefecture, Japan. Harmful blooms are common in Nagasaki, and the list of causative species with their cell density is prepared for hub monitoring. For example, one cell of Chattonella antica and 100 cells of Karenia mikimotoi per ml are detected. Then information is provided to relevant community and people, such as fishermen. If the target species is recognized in the hub monitoring area, it is helpful for the early detection and the quick action for mitigation of fisheries damage. In Southeast Asia, fisheries damage has so far been caused by lactophyte shuttle species and the dinoflagellated cochlodinium, polyculicoides, carenia, carlodinium, and takayama species. This information is given by Inigues et al. this year. She's uh, actually a speaker of this session. In East Asia, major harmful algal bloom species are lactophytes, Chattana species, and dinoflagellate Karenia mikimotoi, Heterocarpus circular stoma, Cochlodinium polyculicoides. Information of causative species and fisheries damage are provided in Sakamoto et al. This is also provide, uh, published in this year. For preparation of local hub species list, information with species distribution is useful. However, detailed information is limited in this region. This is some example for species of Chattanera, Cochlodinium, and the Karenia Sea. Recently, distribution of hub species is compiled for each species in Chinese course by Gu et al. This, is, this information is also very useful. As for the Raphidophytes Chattana species, distribution information is compiled recently by Lam et al. in this year. It had been reported only three cases until 1989 and now wide distribution of these species is recognized and in the species level with the help of the molecular markers. In the Western Pacific, the hub species have newly been detected recently. For example, fisheries damage was caused by carloading in Australia, in Malaysia and Singapore in 2014 and 15. Takayama species, in the Philippines in the 2016 and the year after. Karenia species in Kamchatka last year, in the last year. Also now, severe fisheries damage, such as mass mortality of sea urchin being caused by the dinoflagellate Karenia seriformis in the Pacific coast of Eastern Hokkaido, Japan. This harmful bloom started in early in this September and now still blooming. The bloom of Karenia seriformis is the first record in Japan and the fisheries damage would be the worst record in terms of the economic loss in Japan. 
Therefore, we also need to keep updating the hub species list in the local and in this region. So for summary of my talk, number of hub species are increasing in the IOC UNESCO reference list of harmful microalgae due to the reports of the new species and the new combination. Number of hub species are increase, increasing also in the West Park region due to the new records of hub species in this region. Local hub species list is helpful for the local hub monitoring and the regional hub species distribution can be utilized to prepare local hub species list. Thank you for your attention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, is there any questions from for Dr. Iwataki? Uh, I didn't see any raising hand uh, hand raise for the, for this, but uh, um, probably start with me. I, I think we have a bit of time to to ask. Um, you see, consider Japan has the probably one of the most comprehensive uh, monitoring program on HAP mm -hmm. and with very long history and record. And uh, the 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 occurrence of this uh, Carinia saliformis mm. is something not in the list or actually a new record in Japan. And is that any effort to improve in terms of you know detection of this uh, cryptic or rare species uh, in in our you know in the in our own coastal waters? I guess mm -hmm. that is the questions that I have for you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Actually, the occurrence of this species is the first record in Japan and probably also in this region. But the last year, that the same species was uh, detected from Kamchatka, Russia. So in Japan, the, yeah, we now try to obtain the main information about this species, for example, the cell shape, because the Cell shape is actually a bit different from the original description that was given from the New Zealand. And uh, after that, uh, reported from the Chile. So now, yeah, we try to compare that species and maybe later we report the occurrence and the morphological and the phylogenetic information of the Carinia cellformis. Yeah. Um, um... A subsequent follow-up questions on this is um since mm -hmm. the the you mentioned about uh, the occurrence of bloom actually started in September is there yeah. any effort by the locals or the fishery authority to to mitigate this particular bloom because the scale seems to be huge uh, yeah. for our large area so but anyway the so any information on that ah. Uh... The, yeah, yeah, how like to answer? Modify clay or, you know, the removal, early harvesting, so to minimize the impact. Is there uh, any uh, effort uh, that you uh, can uh. learn from that? Yeah, this time the fisheries damage, it's the bit different from the usually we have in the US and Japan. Because the usually, we have the fish kill of the mm. farmed fish. So they are, uh, we uh, they try to mitigate the damages to the uh, early marketing or the uh, some other methods. But in this case, the yeah, sea arching were killed, but the, we just noticed after the yeah, mass mortality. Probably that was already killed the one week before. Yeah, like that. So difficult to mitigate that. Okay. And also the fish mortality, that it's the, something like the wild salmon just catched by the fixed net. So the, yeah, we cannot manage that okay. the, yeah, fish kill. Yeah, I, th I think you, uh, Dr. Yu, from, uh, you have questions and when maybe follow up with that. So, uh, Dr. Yu? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question follow on um, you know, the, the, your questions about uh, the, the, the Karenia cyphermis. So, uh, yeah, last year it formed a, a very intensive bloom in the coast water of Russia and this year in Japan too. Yeah. Just when, when you're, uh, Professor Iwataki, uh, mm -hmm. could you give some idea on the origin 
or the mechanism why <laughs> this kind of bloom will happen. Yeah, thank you for your, your question, Ren Cheng. <laughs> yeah, actually, we are now thinking about that mechanism. Yeah, actually, that、uh, yeah, similar bloom was detected in Russia last year. So, if the population is the same, that red tide was the seed population what came. But、uh, yeah, that area is、uh, very cold. We still don't know how to overwinter, how to survive under the very low seawater temperature. Now we try to obtain the, that kind of information. For example, the, around the sea surface the, during winter time, that around zero degrees Celsius. And also in the 100 meter deep, that temperature also around zero. So, yeah, at the、uh, moment, very big to consider t h i s Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think、Thank、when you, you have、yeah. questions,、uh, then. Yeah, I'm、uh, interested in the, the sea urchin、uh, diet in Hokkaido.、Uh, is it the culture or the natural uh, uh, sea urchin? And、uh, what is the mechanism of uh, uh, killing? It's,、uh, Depletion, oxygen depletion, or toxin, or whatever, because、uh, it's quite、uh, interesting and new to me. Thank you. Thank you, Nguyen. Yeah. So, the, yeah, I can answer. We don't know. <laughs> That is <laughs> But true. Probably, the, yeah. Okay. That species produces some kind of the bioactive compounds that the, yeah, affect to the CRT. But、oh. uh, yeah, we still don't know what kind of the compounds are、yeah, produced by that species. And probably not by the oxygen depletion.、Hmm. Yeah, because、uh, yeah, that area is not closed. Is that is natural、uh, CO2? Ah, yeah, yeah. So, how to answer? That it's the. Actually, that juvenile were released, but there's something like a natural. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> not、okay. in the case. I, I think we can, if you have, still have questions, we can keep it during the question and answer session.、Uh, then we move on、uh, with、uh, at the next speaker, k e n s u n Dr. He from、uh, University of Malaya. So, yeah, you can share.、Uh, so,、um, okay. 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 Can I can I start now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good morning to everyone. So my name is Kim Sun. Ah,、uh, from University of Malaya, Malaysia, and it is my distinct privilege here to share with you all about the the recent advance in the harmful algae bloom, with as the title, ah,、uh, harmful microalgae monitoring assessment with the meta barcoding approach. So the rapid developments are subjected to the disturbance from the land debris or other anthropogenic activity. They lead to the deterioration of water quality and nutrient enrichment, or also known as a、uh, eutrophications in the water, have drive the shift of the phytoplankton community from the high species diversity to monospecific. They often form the harmful algae bloom, and it it, will, it has caused the Uh, fish kill and seafood contamination due to the microalgae biotoxin, and beside that, the high、uh, biomass、uh, algae bloom due to the high nutrient will also lead to the dissolved oxygen depletion in the water. They cause the fish die in suffocation. So the impact of the the harmful algae bloom and algae bloom has been well recognized.、Uh, however, the fundamental research、uh, effort on the medication. Detection and prediction are still less. Therefore, the effective the the hard management and medication effort are crucial, which is is rely on fast,、uh, reliable and accurate tools、uh, for detecting or monitoring the hard species. So, as you all know, the traditional、uh, conventional approach, such as a、uh, classical taxonomy identification with the microscopic method, are time-consuming and labor-intensive. So, the microscopic approach also has a higher degree of the inconsistency in identifying species, and this becomes further、uh, complicated, owing to 
the co-occurring or morphological closely related species or critic species complex, such as the Alexandrian species or Pseudonysia. And also some fragile species, uh, such as the naked dinophyllite uh, and the raphitophyte, are uh, easily deformed morphologically or burst during the sample handling that make the microscopic uh, immunization become difficult. And the microscopic approach uh, also required with the taxonomy uh, expertise or certain skill in species identification, while the identification mostly only until the genus levels. Therefore, the highly accurate genetic distinction approach, which is the meta barcoding, are essential to monitor the heart species. A meta barcoding is a fast genetic approach to illustrate the comprehensive taxonomy profile in the environment, and it is reliable due to the taxonomy assignment are based on the sequence similarity on the reference genome in the huge database. So compared with the traditional method of the microscopic approach, with the, micro, uh, with the meta barcoding, the large number of samples can be processed simultaneously. And then of course, it can reduce the cost associated with the method and also the turnaround time of getting result is reduced. And also the sensitivity and the sensitivity is quite enhanced, which it can capability to detect previously unknown uh, species or novel species. So as you can see below here are the workflow of the meta coding. So the meta coding start with the collection of the environment sample. So it could be the it could be the water samples, sediments, or soil. So for the water sample collection, generally the environmental plankton can be uh, either collected by using the submersible pump, plantains, uh, bentons or plantain net, while the sample volume, um, for the sample volume, the collection water sample volume is based on the environment. For instance, for the uh, for the offshore, usually can be collected uh, uh, more than ten liters, and for the coastal, it can be uh, in within one liter or sometimes can be more. And the collected sample need to be uh, filter fractioning based on the desired targeted cell size and precess either with the saline ethanol or from aldehyde. Then followed by store the precess sample in uh, 4 Celsius or minus 20 Celsius to prevent the DNA degradations. So the environment sample were later brought to the lab where the eDNA of sample were extracted and this followed by the PCR amplification of uh, one or several uh, taxonomy informatic marker or primer, they're able to catch the entire examples, uh, for example, uh, bacteria, eukaryote, or plantains. And so the uh, perfect uh, meta barcoding DNA uh, should be present in all the organisms or cells. And the sequence of the uh, target regions need to be uh, variable among different species and conserved among the individual of the same species. And it is also need to be easy to amplify and not too long for sequencing. And of course, the sequence region need to be uh, available in the uh, accessible, accessible database reference such as the GeneBank, uh, PR2, or SIBA. So as you can see, the table here are the common metabarcoding markers they use based on the different uh, target organisms. So then the umbrella of the targeted region were subsequent sequence with the high throughput uh, sequencing technology. Even though nowadays, uh, the new technology, a uh, new sequencing technology continues to emerge, but the Illumina mindset uh, can really dominate and has smoothly replaced the old technology, which is the ROM 454 sequencer. Then followed the, by the, the bioinformatic processing and the species identification. The reprocessing uh, and the bioinformatics is uh, usually done by the packets such as the Chime 2, Mota, or Dada 2. Um, and the sequence read uh, generally will undergo with the, with the read pairing and demultiplex removal or correction of the sequence error, removal of the cameras, primer uh, treatment, clustering and deep replications, and taxonomy assignment based on the a reference database uh, such as the GeneBank, PR2, or SIVA to generate the operation taxonomy unit, which is the OTU or variants of the identified TASA. 
then the read of the representative RTUs or variants of the TASA can be further used in the ecology analysis, such as the diversity, community structure, and population dynamic. So in here, I would like to show you the study from my group. They use, they use the meta barcoding approach to investigate uh, the temporal partial change in the, the harmful algae bloom community example along the Johor Strait. And this study not only show the sensitive, show the, the sensitive and the reliable of the meta coding in the heart species detection, but it's also useful in the heart, uh, the harmful algae bloom community example dynamics. So for your information, the Johor Strait is an important site of the marine culture for Malaysia and Singapore. Besides the marine culture activity, the threat also experiencing the huge ecosystem damage due to the rapid economy uh, deployment involved, uh, involving the various uh, barrier human activities such as the seafloor, grating for shipping land maintenance, land reclaim, uh, reclamations for the resident or, or the commercial properties. And from this study, the eDNA of plankton sample were collected monthly uh, between May 2018 and September 2019, covering with the 90 stations across the Johor Strait. So while uh, for the methodology of this study, the plankton sample were collected uh, using a 15 micron mass of plankton net followed by a vacuum filter with 0 2 pore side of the nylon membrane filter and preserved in the saline ethanol. And the eDNA of the plankton were isolated by using the commercial extraction kit and uh, the V918 SRDNA was amplified by using a pair of specific eukaryote primer. And then the umbrico was analyzed by the Illumina MySeed and the bioinformatic uh, processing was done by the MOTA. So from the high throughput sequencing uh, meta data, a total of 377 photopendent TASA were reviewed from the one, uh, 107 thousand read and several predominant titans such as the Scratinema, Eucambia, Isoselenia, and Tarasusilla were, were relative high in the data. So from the alpha beta uh, alpha diversity analysis based on the RTU risk of the phytoplankton data, we found the higher uh, phytoplankton diversity were observed uh, in the outermost station of the Johor Strait. And beside that, with the high sensitivity and the specificity of the meta barcoding approach, we can, uh, we can manage to discover 26 OTU uh, was associated with the, has, uh, the harmful algae bloom species, where 11 OTU of the harsh species belong to the previously unrecorded species in the Johor Strait. So, and so we also can found that the highest, the harsh species richness were observed in the Outermost uh, station. And the OTU of the heart species rib were further analyzed by the, we can further analyze by the dual hierarchical custody analysis to investigate the distribution and abundance of the heart species in the Johor Strait. And from the analysis, we show that the Heterosima Akashi Wolf, Bukasa, Japonica, and Sudonesia Panjang were distributed in high abundance throughout the Johor Strait. And with the Venn diagram analysis, it showed that the Pseudonesia pseudotelicacisma was only detected in the Western Johor Strait. And for, for the, the Prynesians and Chetanella Sassansa Caladinian uh, Beneficent and the Poricucal Hemani were only detected in the Eastern Johor Strait. And beside that, the OTU of the heart species rib uh, can also correlate with the ecology parameter such as the temperature, uh, pH salinity, dissolved oxygen, and variant nutrient constraint to assess the, the characteristic or trend of the of the yeast uh, heart species assembled. So, for instance, in here, the CCA uh, showed that the Pseudonesia delicatissima, Pseudonesia motisiata, uh, Satanella mariana, and uh, Fabricasa japonica were were exhibited. Uh, in the ambient with the tight mix uh, mass, which is a high turbulence, low temperature, and relative low MP ratio environments. So if you're interested to know more about the finding, 
funding of this uh, finding of from this uh, study, you can find uh, the article from the from this article from our day uh, helpful out there. And as the conclusion, metabolic coding approach is a uh, useful for the heart species diagnosis due to its sensitivity and high accurate detection. And the information of the the heart uh, metabolic coding sample across the potential hotspot will be useful in identifying the source of the bloom and possibly predict the, the probability of bloom. And the meta barcoding data provide the variable baseline data of the marine phytoplankton and heart species community example diversity. And it will be crucial for future analysis, uh, monitoring and study related to climate change impact on the coastal productive, uh, productivity, uh, ecosystem health and food resource in the coastal water. So, and thank you and, and I'm happy with to take any questions from you all. Okay, thank you, Kenson. So, um, if uh, if there is any questions from uh, for Kenson, please uh, raise your hand. Then uh, then we can have uh, one or two. Uh, yes, uh, maybe start with uh, Dr. Iwataki. Then after that, with uh, Dr. Wang, Hopi. Yeah. So, thank you, Kenson. Yeah. For the interesting talk. I'm interested in the molecular species. The previously I think the SSU, ATS, ribosomal DNA sequences were widely used also for the metabar coding. But the currently the ITS or the LSU, the reference data is um, deposited, I think, mainly for dino project. How to arrange that kind of the molecular species to detect the harmful algae, in particular the dinoflagellates? Yeah, this is something uh, related to the, the reference database. Mm. So in terms of, yeah, nowadays, even though uh, we have the re a lot of reference database at NCBI, PR2, NCBA, but all of them data is actually not robust, uh, robust enough. So that means uh, is some some species will not have yeah. uh, will not have the sequence inside the database, mm. so this is become a uh, something uh, a challenge uh, for us for doing the meta coding. So mm. the one thing we can do now is uh, whether we can establish. Uh, I I hope we can or uh, in future we can establish a a complete um, um more robust database um for detecting all the heart species. I, I know some species, uh, they are more, more suitable use ITS to, to, to distinguish the, to differentiate or distinguish the species. Um, that's why uh, we need to come back to the database as well. So let's say ITS, right. we hope that we can have the uh, database is, uh, is all of ITS with the complete heart species. Then we easily can use, directly can use the ITS, uh, the, ITS uh, uh, database to identify the species. But even though uh, a different kind of species, they have di different kind of species, they have the different regions to detect it, uh, to identify, to di distinguish. But we also can use a different kind of primer marker uh, for, for, to, for detection or to do the meta coding in the further analysis. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Kenson. Uh, Pengping? Maybe yeah. a short one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you hear me? It's okay. Yes. yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kingston. It's a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah. About uh, your. Uh, actually, I have some question about the uh, meta barcoding. Uh, just also like the Iwa Takisam uh, have referred, uh, no matter how the target regions. And also, uh, I also see your data, you didn't uh, refer many of the absolutely. Uh, uh, abundance of the species, right? Uh, yeah. Of different years. Uh, actually, I want to just uh, if you have see some uh, phenomena of the different sites, as we know, especially for the dinoflagellates, uh, the copy numbers of the DNA, the, the target regions will be different from species uh, to species, even in the same uh, genus, I think. So before I also do some of this work, but uh, though we can get the very, as you referred, we have, uh, it's very, uh, have many advantage about the uh, meta uh, coding, but uh, for uh, we, I think we still have a long way to go to uh, to give some uh, to 
to there are many gaps uh, to make real uh, for calculating uh, the the numbers of the different species in one times of the yeah yeah, yeah right 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 do you have uh, any uh, any suggestion or comments on these because as we, we really uh, I really find some uh, real case uh, in if we really want to apply these techniques uh, to real uh, monitoring or uh, detecting the harmful algae blooms. Though, of course, when harmful algae blooms blooms, uh, we can uh, know yeah, the dominant species. species. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. for general monitoring, uh, the different species maybe. Uh, maybe for for example a a and b maybe actually uh, we the real numbers of a is much more than b but when we calculate the uh, when we get the data from the uh, my, my meta coding maybe b is much more than a doing what i mean right yeah yeah i understand yeah, yeah. Uh, this is also one of the challenges uh, mm. that we face in the meta coding we use the meta coding but but instead, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, we know that the different species, they have the different kind of uh, you know, mixed copy numbers size. But in terms of nowadays, I thinking we're planning, uh, I think my junior also, uh, they are trying to do something, uh, we are trying to do something like uh, uh, machine learning. So we try to get, uh, we try to collect as much sample, uh, sample, then we try to analyze as much sample we have. So from the OTU number we get, we try to use and comp of course we also want to compare the uh, try to do the comparison with the actual cell number count. So we try to establish a database to do some uh, machine learning. So that from the machine learning we try to correlate it. So that you of course machine learning we need to have a lot of data, a, a bunch of data, so that you can support it and support it. The let's say this OTU three OTU we can representative a uh, uh, ten species. Uh, it's a ten, 10 cell. So we a lot of the, the data we have, uh, let's say maybe 1,000, I'm not sure how much, so that the machine learning can help you to predict or can help you to generate the, uh, the to generate the, or forecast the, the, the data so that it can show you the OTU can relate with the cell numbers. And, Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's still at, at the very early stage now. Yeah, so, it's still in a very early stage. So, yeah. okay, I think I think it's almost time. So, I guess um, uh, for to uh, question from Pumping and uh, Ms. Nori, I guess you can refer to the paper, um, uh, the hub species in Gulf of Thailand by uh, Dr. Goose and his group that uh, related to how to use three different markers, the SSU, the LSU, and the ITS. Uh, for student XR, it's only possible to use ITS region. Yeah. And because we have the in-house database for student XR, so that's why we can ID all the uh, student XR in Gulf of Thailand to species level. I get that that is some advantage that we have. And that worked for some species, some group or some genus. But, uh, but it, we, it, we need time to develop for heterocapsa, for example. For Carinia, for example, I think that is a lot of effort needed uh, in the um, you know ongoing effort that we have to do in order for us to ID to all to species level. Yeah, I think we have to move move on. So next, I think we have Kazumi, right? So yeah, go ahead. So thank you very much, uh, Potin. So let me introduce yeah, my slides. Okay, slide show. Is it okay or presentation mode? Uh, yes, now it's okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Kazumi Wakita from Tokai University, Japan. My talk uh, will introduce some recent social science studies on HIV, through which aiming at uh, stimulating your thinking about how social science and natural science can work together to mitigate the imp negative impact of health. So this uh, is 
and newspaper. Reporting fisheries damage by red tide uh, in East Hokkaido, as Iwataxa mentioned. It reported that fisheries damage surpassed more than 4 billion, and now it is set as over 8 billion. So it is now, it has become the largest uh, fisheries damage in Japan throughout uh, like over 50 years. So as you know, there are mainly two aspects of HABs, namely red tide and shellfish toxin. And respective impacts of those, these two phenomena are to the society are very different. So for example, when we do money, monetary valuation of direct damage, so regarding red tide, we usually calculate the dead fish, the economic damage of dead fish. But uh, regarding the shellfish toxin, since the shellfish does not die because of the HAB, so usually what we calculate is about the uh, damage to the human health. So for example, the, like the hospitalization of the people. And also regarding the impact on communities, for example, livelihoods and cultures. So regarding red tide, usually uh, we calculate the impact on the fisher, fishermen and fishery communities. But on the other hand, uh, regarding the shellfish toxin, we have the recreational activity called like clam picking in some countries. So the shellfish toxin also does affect to the citizens for the recreational people. And to, for us for the mitigation and adaptation, so for example, clay spray are uh, conducted or to the red tides, to the red sized some species, and also for the shellfish toxin, some uh, aquaculturists ship earlier than they planned. So what uh, they calculate is that like, what will be the uh, economic loss if they did ship the shellfish to the market at the expected time if uh, without a shellfish toxin occurred. And uh, it, in addition to these uh, aspects, we have also calculation or the studies about the reputation damage and also social acceptance of mitigation and uh, adaptation countermeasures by the people. people. So to date, a variety of studies on monetary valuation of impact caused by HABs accumulated. And last year, a compendium of case studies on evaluating, reducing, and mitigating the cost of HABs was published. And impact on these aspects are examined. And from our region, Lim and others did a comprehensive study on economic impacts and management of cocoloding in Korea. So if you are interested, please check the uh, publication. And now let me talk about an example of adaptation to paralytic shellfish toxin PSD at regulation of pump picking parks in Osaka, Japan. This drawing shows a scenery of recreational clam picking called Shio Higari around 200 years ago. The Shio Higari is a traditional marine recreation and people enjoy it as a family event even today. However, along Osaka Bay, eastern part of which is eastern part of Seto Inland Sea in Japan, Paralytic shellfish toxin occurs almost every year since 2002, and the main causative species is Alexandrine tamarense. In Japan, we have recreational clam picking parks. People pay picking fee at an entrance and enjoy clam picking, 
and bring clamps back home, which they picked by themselves. And operators of the parks, usually fishermen cooperatives, they scatter clams in the area to secure enough clams to be picked. And why is scattering clam necessary? Is because catch of wild clam in Japan, shown as green bars, has decreased. And especially in Osaka, in Blue Line, wild clam catch rapidly decreased during 1950s and has not recovered since then. In general, if shellfish toxin surpasses regulatory limit by test, clam picking parks are requested to close by local governments. But in Osaka, they keep opening parks even when the, it is over regulatory limit by taking food safety measures, which is different from other areas. This figure shows system of exchanging clams, which secure food safety at the clam picking park. They purchase clams with results of toxin test and the clams are weighed and packed for exchanging them from those collected by visitors. And surprisingly, this system had been introduced since before the first PSD surpassing the regulatory limit. Why? Because the climbing park is within artificial beach where wild clams cannot grow now. And this was lucky for them to address shellfish toxin. They could adapt to the shellfish toxin through operating this system. And this system from one park has spread to other two clam picking parks in Osaka prefecture. And after the first PSD detection in 2002, the number of visitors dropped down to less than 30,000. But after introducing the exchanging system of clams introduced to all parks in Osaka Prefecture, then the number of visitors recovered to over 50,000. And if you are interested in more details are in Humble Algae News number 67, so please check it. So if we look back to the West Park region, there has been PSP cases. These are some examples shared among participants when we had a regional training course in 2017 on mitigation and management of hubs. As you see, in some places, PSP occurs and even some fatalities happen, unfortunately. One example happened outside monitoring area and the other happened uh, through eating green mussels, not through the market, but outside the market. That is through sharing seafood among neighbors. So from these experiences, we can consider how we can do, how can we do to decrease poisoning cases uh, outside the monitoring area? And how can we design the monitoring areas and systems. And also what can we do to decrease poisoning cases happen outside market? These aspects are some examples of what social science studies could contribute to together with natural science. And in addition to address shellfish toxin, we also need to address red ties, which have geography geographically expanded and increased fisheries damages. This figure shows trends of red tides caused to chatonelize PP and associated fisheries damage over the past 50 years in the region. 
To mitigate negative impact caused by red tides, we have many good examples or practices in the region, which will be introduced to later by colleagues. And to mitigate negative impact caused by shellfish toxin and red tides, we can accumulate case studies on good examples and good practices through which we can learn each other and think about what we can do at our respective places in each country. And it will be useful to clarify factors and social systems which enable mitigation, management, and adaptation measures to be successful. As you, we all know, we have diverse political systems, social structures, economic conditions, and local cultures and habits in the region. So we cannot simply copy one good practice to others, but we can learn important essences which could be applied to our own respective societies through accumulating variety of case studies, I think. So in thinking about HAVs, there are three major stakeholders. There is namely citizen, fisherman, or operator of recreational activities and national and local government. And this holistic approach as a whole system is important for social science studies and HAVs to contribute to address HAV issues. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kazumi. So um, I would like to invite questions for if there's any. So please raise your hand and then and turn on your video so then we can have some discussion on this topic. I think this is very important and also and of course the natures of and background social system are very different. So I guess that is. Uh, uh, there, are, there are lessons that we can learn from this, uh, the business model of this clam picking in Japan and how we can actually, you know, depurate the toxins, which is actually proven scientifically and uh, keep the toxic uh, clam into uh, clean waters, let it depurate for some time, then we can actually turn turn it into a different business model like what we have now. So. Of course, it's shortened time, the need for depurations, like if they keep them into the bloom waters. So any questions from the audience? Um, if, uh, yes, Fukui Sensei, I can see you, your hand. So please unmute and... Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, the, I have a question for Wakita-san and Iwataki-san. There as Wakita san shows, uh, Japan has a long history on the mitigation of, against the red tide of the Chatonera, how to save uh, fishermen, coastal society from the damage of uh, Chatonera red tide, because it is uh, one of the biggest fish killer. And is there any effort to apply that mitigation system to the Hokkaido red tide case, Karenia red tide case occurred this year. They, it killed wild sea urchin and also wild fishes, not only caged, but, uh, but also wild ones. So if there is any good effort it will be one of the example. As we have more than 20 years experience of the mitigation against red tide. And it, I feel it's quite curious now. No report on the effort to avoid the, or reduce the uh, damage by Karenia seriformis. Thank you very much. If Wakita-san and uh, Iwataki-san knows any information on me, please so, let me know. Thank you very much, Fukuo-sensei. And uh, I am hesitant to answer your question because I don't have uh, 
good information about what they did about the mitigation. And if Iwataki-san knows, please let me also know, because uh, it is not a good practice. But what I understand now is that uh, in Japan, uh, we have the system of insurance, not by the uh, private sector, but among the fisheries association, fisheries collaboratives. But uh, since the red tide, red tide cases only happened in the western part of Japan by now, so the red tide cases cannot cover to that northern area. So that is what I heard about the insurance system. So now uh, they are, con I, I believe that they will consider the geographical expansion of the coverage of the red tide insurance cases. That, that's all what I know about uh, uh, for, for the time being. Thank you very much. Ibataki Song, any comment from you? About the mitigation? Yeah. <laughs> In my understanding, we could nothing to decrease the fishery damage in case of the Hokkaido plume. Yeah, all we are now trying to identify and enumerate that the yeah, just cell number and try to understand what's happened in the eastern part of the Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe some information for me to share. If you follow the, the early sessions on this uh, Indo-Pacific Convergence Centers, uh, there's one presentation from IOCAS uh, uh, from uh, about this. Uh, I think Dr. Yu can talk, talk about more about this. The use of modified clay that they have successfully used it to control various types of bloom in, along the coast of China. And they also intend to to, to apply and to seek for collaborations with people that are uh, interested in this modi modified play. It's already commercial commercially available. So, but of course, that is subject to testing if we, if, whether it works, for example, in Philippines or in Malaysia, because the natures of, you know, the environment might not be exactly the same. Yeah, Fukui Sensei. Yeah, also the, we know uh, some chemicals are very effective not only clay, but also chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide, spray of the hydrogen peroxide in the wild ocean, open sea, to a certain level of concentration. It kills the phytoplankton without giving any damage to fish larvae or some other chemicals such as formalin. It's also useful, but but in case of Japan, fisheries agency doesn't like that treatment because public doesn't accept the fish from the area treated by chemical. So it, uh, how to say, public sense without scientific, uh, how to say, true information. But yeah. That is the point of the SDG, how to make new technology to con in considering with the science social acceptance. Thank you. Dr. Yu or Dr. Yeah. Yuan? Yeah, uh, just to just follow uh, yeah, the, the comments. Uh, I don't know uh, whether Dr. Yuan is in the group or not, but yeah, the, I think the group in uh, our class has did a uh, very good job in development different types of uh, modified clay. You know, they, they, use, uh, they, they try to combine the clay with some kind of chemicals uh, to increase the efficiency uh, in re removing the harmful algae. But uh, that's not the most important. I think the most important Important thing that in the last several years they have developed several different facilities to try to uh, spray the, the modified uh, clay into seawater very efficiently. And this kind of uh, technique and products has been uh, used uh, if, uh, widely in, you know, in the coast waters of China to treat different types of uh, Hamburg bloom like uh, Fusis globosa. Um, Orococcus and the and this technique was also used to treat uh, 
a long lasting uh, bloom of Carinia brevis in the Gulf of uh, Mexico in the United States of America. So I think it's a, it's a very good uh, choice to, you know, to, to apply this kind of technique for emergency treatment of uh, herbs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Yu. I mm. think uh, we, we can come back to this subject uh, at the end of right. uh, you know, when we have the discussion sessions. So next we have to move to uh, Aleta. So yeah, so go ahead with your presentations and uh, to see how we move forward with modeling and early detections and so on. Yeah. Okay, is the slide showing okay? Yes, yes. Thank you. Good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'll be giving an overview of our work to develop an early warning system for HABs uh, that can hopefully be a pathway towards enhancing uh, the country's capacity to mitigate the impacts of HABs, as well as uh, start for operational ocean observation and forecasting. So as you can see from the long list of authors, this program has entailed the efforts of many people from an intersection of scientific dis disciplines and organizations, including different universities. Uh, I think Dr. Lenny Yap is here, who is also a collaborator, co-author here, and also, of course, importantly, the regulatory uh, government agency. So I'm presenting this on everyone's behalf. So, just as a background, the Philippines is a, has been plagued by HABs for, I think, more than three decades. And the main HAB syndrome has been paralytic shellfish poisoning, or PSP, and it's been caused mostly by Pyridinium bahamense, with a few sites affected by uh, Alexandrium species that have caused uh, confirmed toxic um, events. And about uh, we've had more than 2,000 cases of PSV through the years with us, a few hundred of these leading to fatalities, unfortunately. So the longest record for HABs in the Philippines comes from shellfish bulletins that have been issued by the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. And this represents paralytic shellfish toxin occurrences beyond uh, the regulatory limit. So note that this record predominantly reflects the occurrence of pyridinium in the different areas of the country. And evaluating this historical record showed that in the first two decades, there was an increase in frequency and duration of the VSD events, most likely due to also increased awareness in monitoring partly, but has stabilized or even slightly decreased in terms of number and duration in the recent years. But uh, it's still quite a... Uh, uh, um, um, a big hazard and a big impact in terms of the number and duration in many areas. Again, based on this record, the occurrence of uh, PSP is increasing in PST is increasing in terms of the number of sites affected. So the uh, it slowed down a bit, but till 1980s to 1990s, on average, two new sites were affected per year. But from 2008 to 2017, about one new site every two years. Although recently there's, uh, I think a spike in the past few years. So the Philippines has actually an established national hub monitoring and management program by the mandated government agency BIFAR. And through this system, field monitoring for phytoplankton and shellfish toxicity is conducted in the different hub affected areas. And depending on the capacity of the area, samples are either analyzed on site or sent to regional laboratories or even the main lab in Manila here um, for, uh, to undergo microscopy. And then for the shellfish toxicity, it's mouse bioassay or at the main lab, um, they make use of RBA. So these provide information for the issuance at the national level of the shellfish advisory bulletin. And this monitoring management program has helped to decrease the PSP cases in the country through the years. So of course, there's still room for improvement. Uh, there's a few gaps that we wanted to address. Um, it provides now cast only and has um, no capacity for more early, more early warning or forecasting. And uh, typically, fish scales aren't really included in, in this um, advisories. It's also only for shellfish toxicity. And there's difficulty actually in collating and analyzing information from the different sites and including information on water quality, which is quite limited. So manpower, of course, is also quite limited since we have a lot of areas that are affected and this can affect the frequency of monitoring and the timely analysis of the samples. 
So with these in mind, we all collaborated to develop uh, and enhance the, the monitoring management um, system for HAB. So to develop this early warning system, which can help address these gaps. So this first component is uh, HAB risk knowledge, which involves understanding the patterns and risk of toxic blooms and fish kills. While the second component is the monitoring and warning service, which involves detecting, of course, and monitoring the HAB organisms and conditions, providing analysis, assessments, and warnings. The third is dissemination communication, involving how best to communicate and disseminate warnings and promote understanding through the different communities. And the last is uh, response capability, which involves how people respond to the warnings or even prior to the occurrence of HAB events, how they can prepare. So I'll go over the key activities as an overview we've, that we've undertaken to build up these different components in our uh, target sites. So for obtaining HABRIS knowledge, it comprised of two main aspects. One is the consolidation and analysis of biophysical information related to HABs, such as phytoplankton abundance, shellfish toxicity, and also the oceanography of the sites. These were through contributions and collation of historical data obtained through research and the agency monitoring efforts. These historical, biological, environmental data are critical in developing any sort of forecast models. So the second aspect is on the socioeconomic information. This was primarily done by conducting a participatory hub risk assessment with the partner communities at the study sites. So these help to understand the impacts of hubs on these communities and stakeholders, as well as derive local knowledge on hubs. The monitoring and warning related activities can be divided into monitoring on site or the field monitoring, and the other is remote monitoring through various technologies. We had several collaborative field monitoring activities with the various program partners that also helped clarify methodological approaches and allowed for standardization with the uh, university uh, partners. One part of the remote monitoring is the use of ocean color for large scale assessment. So the semi-automated uh, HAB detection system or CHABS model was developed by colleagues Aldrin Almo and Dr. Laura David from UPMSI as well. The model processes uh, chlorophyll A concentrations from MODIS Aqua satellite images at four kilometer resolution. This was uh, um, also being developed as kind of an early warning where it can warn of potential blooms using chlorophyll A anomalies. It includes a feedback system called Do You Have It, through which the users, uh, the partners can calibrate, validate, and improve model forecasts by focusing on their sites or zooming in on their sites and then contributing data and information that would modify the uh, anomaly threshold. The second part of remote monitoring is the development of the low cost sensors for real time automated water properties measurement. So in collaboration with a, a physicist, and we developed the SensePAC, which is a low cost sensor that measures temperature, salinity, pH, and dissolved oxygen. It is designed to be modular with battery electronics and communication and sensor modules, and it's, it can be deployed on surfaces like shellfish farms or fish cages and transmit data at program intervals using long range radio frequency to a base station. And then the data is stored in a database. Another uh, effort by Drs. Villanoy, Amanda Repolio, and Rachel Francisco also independently developed the automated water quality monitoring system, which is a flow through setup where water is pumped through the surface through sensors and data on temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and chlorophyll are transmitted using mobile data. So right now, this is deployed at the intensive mariculture area in Bul Bulinao, Pangasinan, northwest of the Philippines. And uh, it's automated to store the uh, information in the database. So there's this, these are still like prototypes and there's still a lot to improve on for these sensors. At a local site, uh, site-specific early warning models can be used if real-time data is available for a site. And currently a model for bullying now has been developed, which is a site with the uh, most extensive interannual biological and environmental data set. So this makes use of the random forest algorithm, a machine learning approach, forecasting probability of shellfish toxicity. Um, in this site, it's Alexandrium species that causes toxicity. 
and also uh, fish gills and fish gills occur in this site a lot. The model is linked to the real time sensor data, the sensors I showed on the slide before. So here you see an example of the forecast from July 16, uh, where fish kills medium probability and shellfish toxicity is at low probability. So we're currently observing the actual performance of this system. So essentially what I've shown so far, we have the following technologies in the early warning system with a real-time ocean observation uh, in the field and satellite images fed into the uh, database and informatics system, which also houses historical data from labs and program partners, which are used for uh, then the output um, analysis and uh, models. And the information are disseminated online and uh, through the relevant agencies and communities. So the system, we call it Hub Hub, uh, the observation informatics system. Uh, this is the website and this is a QR code that you can use to go in. Note that it, it is uh, uh, in beta version uh, currently, and it's literally a hub for the environmental, biological, and model-derived information related to hubs in general water quality. So a key aspect of the program and the development of the system is the engagement of the community and stakeholders from the start of the program. And the participatory HAB risk assessment activity was able to enrich HAB risk knowledge in itself is a capacity building effort through information sharing and affirming local knowledge and capacities. And it also served as a foundation to develop community actions to help mitigate uh, HAB risks. So uh, from this exercise, the communities themselves came up with some suggested mitigation measures where it's strengthening alternative livelihood options so that they are not as impacted by HAB events, considering HAB as an event that allows for a state of calamity to be called and or having measures for financial assistance during such events. Having a plan similar to disaster preparedness for HAB, such as what we have for earthquakes or tsunamis, and ensuring that communities also have access to information and technologies. So this diagram is actually a proposal on how to integrate these new tools and technologies to enhance HAB monitoring management of the regulatory agency before. So the remote monitoring and forecasting capabilities are primarily used to help assess and adjust the needs for field monitoring. And fish kill advisories can be included in local warnings. So the sensor and field monitoring data uh, can be standardized and continuously updated, which can then be, of course, used to further understand HAP dynamics and improve the responses. So the road ahead is still long. Early warning system is essentially in its infancy. And there's a need to strengthen the real-time ocean, ocean observation capacity, including, of course, integrating the um, in a more rapid fashion data on HAB species. So new in-situ imaging technologies are available now, but are very expensive and intensive to maintain. We're, we didn't show this here, but we're also exploring the metagenomics, though I think as has been discussed earlier, operationalizing this would be still difficult at the moment. And we're, for toxicity, we're also investigating a modification of the SPAT for toxin detection. Uh, historical data from different sites need to be further analyzed to more concretely establish patterns and thresholds and develop new models. And um, the flow of processes within the system needs to be improved. Stakeholder engagement and capacities for develop, developing and maintaining the system need to be strengthened. And lastly, and very importantly, in determining how is determining how to sustain the collaborations and efforts for the longer term. So with that, thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, to all the support and um, collaborate further collaborators that we've had. Thank you very much, Alita. So very informative and. Uh, very promising um, future for hub real time and early warning system. So um, I now would like to invite uh, uh, Fugu say you want to have questions? Yes. Yeah, the, thank you very much, Aleta. The You mentioned in the first slide, first or second slide, that the area affected by PSP 
is now still expanding. It means new area, uh, occurrence of PSP at new area. Did you make any effort to, to understand the mechanism of expansion, how to stop the expansion, whether it's uh, shellfish transplantation or what other natural uh, mechanism? Is there any analysis? Uh, this is a very good question, Professor <laughs> Fukuyu. Uh, we, we have our hypothesis, which is the, probably shellfish, the shellfish transport, because we have had um, um, anecdotal reports on transport of from hub affected areas to those areas which have not been affected by hubs and then have occurred. Unfortunately, it's a little sensitive <laughs> because of uh, agencies promoting this as well. So mm -hmm. um, this is something that I do want to look into and also the potential of the cysts to, be, to remain in the shellfish and then transfer to those sites. Uh, and feed the new sites with the blooms, but that that is uh, we would like to explore that further. Thank you. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, the in before the first occurrence in Samar Sea, uh, the first occurrence pyrodium, the people apply the shellfish transplantation project host by BIFA and the uh, shellfish from Kamigi Island. Uh, they spread all over the country. Then paradigm occurred all around. So, so, but still there is not many study or whether the system paradigm attach on the seedlings. And in Japan, we have similar similar experience. Once in Northern Japan, Mutsu Bay, uh, scallop died. The large scale, mass large scale mortality of scallop occurred. Fishermen wanted to transplant the shelf, uh, scallop from Funka Bay in Hokkaido, where the PSP occurred every year. So the government stopped it and allowed only shellfish seedling, which washed completely using the water, uh, which, how to say, showed uh, UV sanitation system. So, so, but actually by considering the cost, the fishermen uh, Aomori, Mutsube, stopped the transplantation. So that kind of an, uh, analysis will be necessary in future to stop the expansion of HAB case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fuhui. Okay, so I guess uh, we, we can move on with the next presentations. The, the next two presentations we have uh, Dr. Yu from uh, IOCAST and then followed by Dr. Park from Korea to share about the hub monitoring in, in first in China. So go over to you, Dr. Yu. Yeah, please get it into presental presentations mode. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, it's my uh, pleasure to share with uh, all the audience here uh, about some of the recent findings on harmful algal blooms related to seafood safety and uh, sustainable agriculture in China. Uh, first, I'd uh, like to start from a short introduction about the status of harmful algal blooms. Uh, here in China, we actually experienced a rapid increase of uh, uh, harmful algal blooms, particularly red ties, uh, from the year 2000. And recently, we can, we can uh, see some decrease uh, in terms of both uh, how frequency and uh, the area affected in the, by harmful algal blooms. But whether this trend is, uh, is, is real or not, I'm not sure. But um, there seems to be a decrease of harmful algal blooms in the coast waters of China. Uh, so uh, a new phenomenon for harmful algal blooms here in China is the different types of uh, uh, phenomena in different regions. For example, in the Bohai Sea, we have a very extensive uh, brown ties caused by orocucus and field barons. In the Yellow Sea, we have uh, the uh, green ties caused by uh, green algae 
our prolifera and the, in the East China Sea, we are uh, in this area very close to the estuary of Sanjiang River, we have a, a large scale blooms of Dandelphalides. And in the South China Sea, we have uh, uh, the bloom caused by Hepatophytes uh, Fusicis globosa. And uh, also in different regions, we have uh, different types of uh, toxic algal blooms. Uh, and these uh, different types of uh, algal blooms lead to are quite uh, different impacts. Uh, the first two impacts are seafood contamination and uh, mass mortality of cultured animals. But besides that, we also have other negative impacts like uh, hypoxia, uh, degraded uh, ecosystem health, and um, some uh, injuries to the marine layer and tourism, and also uh, the operation of a large electricity facilities, uh, particularly fuses caused by fuses globosa, which can block the cooling system. Uh, and there are many agencies in China involved in the monitoring and the studies of harmful blooms. We have already established a very systematic monitoring uh, system for harmful blooms, which is now operated by the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. And for the uh, quality of uh, seafood uh, uh, caused by uh, toxin contamination. The monitoring was operated by the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and the all have uh, their uh, systems for sample collection and uh, analysis. But uh, besides that, we also have uh, many uh, universities and institutes are involved in the studies of uh, Hamburg blooms, for example, the National Mon uh, Marine Environment Monitoring Center uh, in Dalian and in Qingdao, we, uh, the Institute of Oceanology, where I come from, are working on Hanfoga blooms for a long time. And also uh, the Ocean University of China and the first Institute of Oceanography, they're also involved in the studies of Hanfoga blooms. In the southern part of China, we also have universities and institutes in Hangzhou, in uh, Xiamen, and in Guangzhou to get involved. Uh, and so far, we have uh, several key projects working on the mechanisms of uh, harmful blooms and also uh, for the basic uh, investigation of harmful algae and uh, factory toxins in China. So some of the results uh, I, I uh, will introduce later are actually uh, products of these uh, key projects. So I'd like to share with you some of the recent progresses of Hanfoga blooms uh, in coast waters of China. Uh, the first for the toxins are, uh, I think uh, in the last uh, decade, we have increased understandings about the phycotoxins in the coast waters of China. Uh, many groups in, the, in, in China are uh, performed uh, investigation of the toxic algae and the phycotoxins using uh, you know, uh, metabar coding, and using a uh, large volume uh, sampling process to collect enough algae to, uh, for the toxin analysis using uh, LC mass and or HPLC. And then the toxins in different uh, media like uh, uh, net concentrated phy phytoplankton, seawater or sediment were analyzed. So based on this kind of investigation, we have identified several key regions with high risk of seafood contamination. For example, in the Bohai Sea, the coast waters of Qinghuangdao, the, in the Northern Yellow Sea, uh, in, in the, 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 the area very close to Dalian and the, in the estuary of Sanyang River and also uh, in Fujian province in coast waters of Fujian province. So these regions are, uh, sometimes have a high risk of seafood contamination, particularly perlitic shellfish uh, toxins. Um, and also there, uh, there is increased understandings on the production of uh, domoic acid producing diatoms. Uh, this this uh, diatoms which can produce uh, domoic acid are not recognized until the year 2017, uh, the first species recorded was uh, Pseudonychia simulans. And up to now, there are nine species which are capable of uh, producing domoic acid were identified. And uh, recently, uh, during an investigation in the southern uh, China Sea, we can see the uh, toxins uh, in seawater based on, uh, I mean, in, in the net concentrated phytoplankton collected from seawater based on the cruises. Uh, in this region. Uh, and another interesting issue is uh, on the neuro, uh, neurotoxin. Uh, so, uh, so we can call it BMAAs, uh, uh, amino acid, which can have uh, a potential risk of a human 
neurogenesic diseases. And this toxin was usually uh, considered uh, produced by uh, uh, cyanobacteria in fresh water, but recently uh, the, uh, the group from the Ocean University of China, they identified these toxins from the diatoms in the, in the seawater. And also based on the investigation of these toxins in Jiaozhou Bay, they found the apparent about magnification of these toxins. So the, that means the toxins can be concentrated uh, from phytoplankton to high uh, trophic level marine animals. And also we have uh, uh, more understandings on the toxins produced by uh, the epiphyte and the fertilase. So this kind of uh, investigations was mainly carried out in the southern part of China. So they have identified several species which can produce different groups of potent uh, neurotoxins. Uh, so that's uh, some new findings about the phycotoxins uh, in the coastal waters of China. I think the results on domoic acid and uh, also on BMAA are very, quite interesting. And this uh, maybe could be uh, included in the, in the monitoring of uh, toxins in, in other countries. And the second is about uh, um, a very special type of humble gold bloom, uh, which uh, threats the Mariculture industry, as it was called brown ties uh, caused by orcocus and filiferans. And this uh, kind of uh, humble gold bloom was never recorded before uh, in China until the year 2009. And in that year, we noticed uh, a very large uh, growth, uh, uh, the stop of growth by, uh, of the small uh, scallops in the coast waters near Qinghuangdao. And then when we uh, start to look at the microalgae in seawater, we found uh, this very tiny pelagophytes or glucose and anaphytopharynx. And this bloom was continued, uh, continuous recorded in the following years until the year 2015. And then the scale uh, or the biomass of the bloom started to decrease. And now there's no uh, very serious problem of uh, uh, brown tusk now. Uh, so using we, uh, to detect this very tiny microalgae, we developed uh, high specific QPCR methods for the detection. And also based on the metagenomic uh, analysis, uh, we can uh, identify that uh, this species is a dominant species during the blooms. Uh, we, we had considered that this species maybe, you know, the Orococcus and Filiparens may be transported from, uh, maybe transported from the other regions. Uh, could, it could be an invasive species because the, uh, the scallop, uh, uh, which was uh, very extensively cultivated in, in the coast water of China was uh, uh, transplanted from the United States of America, you know, where the brown ties is a very serious problem. But uh, then in the following studies, we found that uh, Orococcus and Anaphytopharynx is widely uh, distributed in the coast waters of China, and also uh, a group of uh, scientists in here in our cast found uh, the you know the DNA of Orococcus and filiferans reserved in the in the sediment core, which can be traced uh, a long time ago. So that means Orococcus and filiferans is an um, uh, indigenous species. Uh, the optimal environmental condition promoted the formation of this brown tide in in Bohai uh, the third uh, type of bloom is uh, microalgal blooms in the Yellow Sea. Uh, this also led to a very intensive negative impacts on the mariculture industry. For example, the uh, accumulated green algae here in the coast of Shandong province uh, killed a lot of um, cultivated, uh, uh, cultivated, uh, our cultivated uh, animals, uh, and also uh, the uh, this, for this type of bloom, uh, the scientists here has been working for a long time and the mechanism is almost uh, uh, found out. But uh, the impacts of uh, these microalgal blooms uh, on marine ecosystem was not uh, quite clear. So we uh, tried to track the settlement region of floating green algae and found that most of the floating green algae were settled in the region uh, southeast to Shandong Peninsula. And very interesting, uh, one very interesting thing is that we look at the phytoplankton communities after the settlement of green algae, and we found an apparent increase of pelagophytes, orococcus, and anaphytopharynx in this region. So there might be some uh, 
linkage between the two different types of uh, microalgal blooms. We have uh, submitted this uh, results to the environmental science and technology, and uh, hopefully uh, it will be published. Uh, it could be published soon. And in the yellow sea, another type of uh, microalgal blooms which uh, uh, threat the mariculture industry is caused by uh, uh, sargassum hundred, uh, which we call a good entice. So. This uh, intensive uh, blooms of microalgae could damage the, the cultural reefs of uh, Popier, new uh, Puropia in the Subi Shore. So in the year uh, 2017, uh, this um, kind of uh, microalgal blooms led to a very serious damage to the industry. And the, uh, for Dandafrenes uh, bloom in the East China Sea, we also uh, post potent threats to the uh, mariculture industry, particularly Karenia mikimotoi. So uh, I, I, I'm very uh, curious to, to know, you know the mechanism for the formation of the Karenia mikimotoi bloom, because for this type of bloom, they didn't appear every year like uh, Danaferle's Procentrum uh, From the year 2002, there are only two uh, bloom events uh, in this region. And every time when Karenia Mikimotoi form bloom, it will lead to huge uh, uh, mass mortality of uh, cultured animals, either fish or uh, the sh uh, shellfish. Uh, and the recent uh, studies in this region found some new species, uh, for example, the uh, Calodinium diditatum. It also led to, uh, uh, to a very serious fish queue event in the year 2019. So that means in, in, in the region uh, of coast waters near uh, the East China Sea, there might, there might be some new bloom costume species besides Karenia and Mikimotoi. And to make a short summary, uh, I think this uh, uh, the Ocean Decade program offer a good chance for us to work together to do the monitoring and, uh, uh, and mitigation of harmful algal blooms. Uh, the studies, I have reported this uh, in the East Hub meeting. Uh, uh, our studies here in China has uh, already goes from the phenomena observation to taxonomy, biology, and the mechanisms of, of harmful algal blooms. Now, uh, I think we should uh, focus more on the monitoring, prediction, prevention of harmful algal blooms to uh, mitigate their negative impacts. So that's a short report. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yu, for a very comprehensive report from uh, papers um, on your research, um, advancement of research in China. I, I see a hand from uh, Nguyen. So yes, go ahead, Nguyen. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, what, can I ask, uh, what is the reason the bar? Reduce in frequency of red tide in China. It's because of you manage the nutrients uh, better, or climate change, or some other organism competing with the uh, nutrients with uh, with microalgae. For example, you you, you have infection. Uh, uh, since that's uh, microalgae blue. more than point, point 0.1 cells, and they start to occur the PSP, measured by mouse power, say. And, and then the, when the, the PSP exceeded the uh, uh, standard level, and we start, we, start the, uh, we start to close the fish farms. And in Korea, the, the Alexandrium, Alexandrium, the maximum cell density is about 10 or 50 cells per milliliter. And in this hour, the PSP uh, monitoring system, also there are several things newly updated. So the first thing is, uh, in, uh, in the past, uh, we only used the microscope and uh, we, we knew the Alexandrium is the PSP species, but we didn't know exactly which species the PSP uh, causing species. So we surveyed the last for the 10 years so we track the Alexandrian species 
using qPCR. And we found out there are four major alexon species in Korea. And uh, that's the uh, Catenella, Perspicum, and Fraticulus affine. And uh, Catenella, that, that species occur only spring. And that's exactly matched to the PSP period. So that means the Catenella is a major PSP species. And for Perspicum, that occur every month, all season. So that means that th this one is partly contribute to PSP. So, so and the temperance range was also exactly the catenella exactly matched to the PSP period. And each species has different temperance range. So that means the, these four species live in the same area, but they don't compete each other. So they have very distinct uh, ecological positions, right? And also the when the strong PSP occurred, the, the character is, uh, the catenella cell density is higher and the temperature was low. The, that's the uh, our PSP pattern. And uh, this uh, last slide, um, this is uh, this year PSP, our mountain region. And the, the PSP, the exceed is the standard level in the mid February. And then the PSP peaked in the mid April. And the red color is catena cell density. And that exactly matched to the PSP event. So catena is a PSP species. And then the catena decrease. In the meantime, the PSP, PSP could increase. So that's why this year the PSP extended to the June. The, the, the one character of this year PSP was the uh, PSP uh, occurred a longer period because of the Pacificum uh, occurred at high density in, in the June. So this is the, our the PSP monitoring system. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Park. So I think uh, we can have questions. Uh, yes, uh, Iwatagi-san, go ahead. Thank you, good question. Why do you include the Alexandrium fraterculus for the PSP monitoring? Uh, the, the reason, the first, what we want to know is the, which one is the major Alexon species. So we measured all the Alexon species in Korea. So that's why fraterculus is non-toxic, of yeah. course. But uh, yeah, we first we measured and then we specified uh, which one is toxic or non-toxic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think, I guess I agree that uh, it's always important to know what we have in our backyard, uh, whether they are non-toxic and toxic, because they're so resemble to each other under microscopy observations. So to able to tell that will help in the monitoring. So so any other questions? Uh, I, I think we have um, to move on. We actually have roughly about five to 10 minutes left for our discussion. So uh, if you have comment and questions, please uh, please raise your hand. So, and uh, I guess uh, we have a very um, fruitful and very interactive discussion today. So uh, it's good to know that um, the emerging species that we have this region and how we can deal with that. So taxonomy is very important because correctly identify, identify a species to species level and that relate to the toxic species, I guess that will be very, very useful for us to tell and very useful to, to the farmer and also to the monitoring agency. So of course, at, we, at the same time, we also have to learn uh, to apply new techniques. It's good to see the very good progress on, on the prototype of monitoring environmental sensors um, that the, the already uh, in operations in Philippines, in Bali now. So hopefully this will be translated into more area, more local, local government that will use the same technology for early warning. And we hope we can, we also can use that. And it's good to see the, the helicopter monitoring and uh, to, to early detect uh, red tides in, uh, in Korea. I, I guess that is also something because uh, most of the time the Marine Police will do their you know, patrolling around the, the country. So that is uh, some additional uh, output that they can contribute to. And uh, I also like um, uh, the, the, the example from, uh, from 
from Wakita Sang. So about this, how to you know use this business model to to the toxic clam and not become non toxic and become a business model in in part of the Japan. So I guess that is very 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 useful because when we look at the the ocean ocean decade outcome, we are trying to to learn from each other's what. Uh, what are the practices that available around us, not only in our country, but also in other neighboring country from our friend that can be applied to adopt and also for us to share with our local monitoring agency, the possibility to adopt like, you know, the apps. Uh, uh, the Malaysian side also, we are trying to develop that to look at the Malaysian hub report. So, but uh, that is only focused on PSP. So I am very um, impressed with the system already uh, uh, in operation in, in, in Korea and also very comprehensive monitoring um, program in, in, in. in China. So I, I think that is uh, it actually very costly. It's also uh, something related to to expenses, the damage to is something that we have to consider in, uh, in um, uh, in safeguard public health, the the operations or sustainability of marine cultures. So how to reduce back to the root of the problem is uh, how we can condition nutrient discharge. So those are effort that we have to look at. So I yeah maybe I'll go to. Kita, so for you to say a few words uh, or your comment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Potin, for uh, sharing your comments. And I I also would like to thank all of you presenters, good practices and uh, very good knowledge development. And, uh, and I would like to encourage all of us, including my, me, myself, to um, do further collaboration uh, in the coming years, because we are in the ocean decade, and we have a very variety of opportunities probably in the coming years. So if you are interested in uh, community uh, collaborating with each other or, or some members among our members, and even to the, to the members from the Global Hub, because uh, Potin and Aleta you know, is a member of the Global Hub project endorsed by the UN Ocean Decade, right? So yeah. yes. um, just uh, thank you for all the contribution and all the participation. Any other comments from uh, all of us? Okay, so I, I focus and say you want to have <laughs> I, the, you are muted, thank you yes. very much. In the uh, how to say I I congratulate the uh, everybody the progress of the hub. But uh, I one one thing I I wish to give more one subject the beside the face of Limpotin you just uh, left side have science for societal application. How to apply our knowledge, our science to society? That part, the not much developed yet. So for example, early warning, then the people have warning. For example, if typhoon come, people will close doors and uh, windows and the uh, cover thick uh, the material the, to prevent the house or anything. In case of hub, if people get the monitoring result, how they can prepare, what they have to prepare, that kind of information, that kind of science not yet developed well or in order to develop that science, we have to utilize Westpac 
or IOC system to collect all information. I give comment, I give question to Wakita-san and Iwataki-san, whether we Japanese, whether we use knowledge uh, which had uh, from the Chatonella fish killing bloom, whether we, uh, we apply that knowledge to Hokkaido, Karenia, Retail cases occurring now, the answer is not yet. Yes. In order to that, we need to collect the information, not only Japan, but also China, Korea, and Southeast Asia, and Westpac can provide the useful mechanism to collect that information. Thank you very much. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Sensei, for, for your very constructive comment. And I think that is very true. So I guess that is uh, the differences or the shortcoming that we have to address. Uh, for example, um, the Alaska actually monitors citizen scientists monitoring program that help to monitor PSP in the region. So I guess uh, similar, I mean, in, in our case, PSP are mainly the mandatory or the responsibility of the fishery agencies and somehow the public are not directly involved. So I guess that is something uh, lacking that in our side that we can be more engaging. We should um, try to uh, reach out to the fishermen community, fishermen associations and even farm operator. I have been contacted by some farm operators and they, they are keen, but the, the thing is, when talk about uh, in investment or initial capitals that related to how they can monitor their, their farm, so then they, they somehow they become a bit reluctant. So I guess that is uh, something that we have to continue to approach uh, farm operators so that they can protect their investment. So, um, and for locals, um, I think I would like to also take the opportunity to share one because of the lack of understanding uh, by public. And now we have a lot of uh, pseudo fake news or fake news that in the, in the media. And uh, that caused a lot of damage to, to our um, agriculture industry. For example, Sungai Geting Alga Bloom due to Minutum and become the the ban of shellfish for the whole east coast of Peninsular Malaysia that appear in the media. So uh, because of a small bloom in an area that uh, two or three kilometers affected very small for small you know, numbers of trader and harvester become a warning to the whole east coast of Pen Pen Peninsular Malaysia that you know, there are people are advised not to eat. I mean, from all these YouTubers and social medias. I guess that is also something that we have to carefully and look at uh, in the future is how to uh, elevate the uh, science awareness of public and don't simply believe uh, something, you know, uh, re uh, depend on the reliable sources of information. I guess what they have apps, um, uh, authentic sources of information to the public, to the farmer, to the, you know, so that will be, that, that will overcome this sort of problem of pseudo fake news or fake news in, in, the, in the social medias. So I, I think with the time constraint, we have to close our sessions. I, I would like to take the opportunity together with uh, Dr. Wakita, so the co convener for these sessions, and uh, to thanks all of you uh, for continuing to stay with us, uh, for spending your time. Uh, Dr. Yu, uh, uh, Dr. Ibataki, Aleta, uh, thank you also to Fukuyo Sensei for, for coming over to join us. I'm very happy to see you and uh, Ken Soon. So I, I, I think that is, uh, we have more opportunity to, to in, interact and exchange, certainly. And uh, we will certainly keep in touch again uh, from Westpac, from Global Hub. And, and of course, on our personal capacity to exchange information that we hope that will help to minimize the impact, to help to improve the system that we have, improve our understanding on hub in the region to, for UN Ocean Decades. Uh, I think that is my 
closing. Uh, back to you, Wakita san So, so. Thank to you too. <laughs> thank yeah, you very much, Poti, and, and all the speakers and all the participants. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Take care and stay safe. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Rani. Thank, thank you, Rani. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.